So now we're moving to the business end of the tank, the turret, and we're going to start with the commander's hatch. Now the M26 had known failings with the engine and the transmission, but another known failing was with the commander's hatch itself. Over rough ground, it had a very unfortunate habit of coming loose, swinging forward and hitting the commander in the head. In fact, so notorious was this that the manual of 1948 gave specific instructions for a field expedient method of fixing this by drilling holes in the hatch system and installing a car pin. Another feature about the hatch is that it has a periscope mounting if you wish to install a periscope and the entire interior is mounted on roller bearings together with an azimuth scale that the commander could tell with great precision what it was that he was looking at in relation to the turret's gun. Okay, let's go inside. So once inside, the commander is seated in his traditional position behind the gunner. He has a commander's override. He can traverse the turret by use of this lever by pushing forwards or backwards to traverse to the left or to the right. As you move around, he has six direct vision prisms to give 360 degree vision. And directly to his rear is the SCR 528 radio set. You'll note that it's mounted lengthwise. In order to reach some of the further controls, you have to go a long way back. It's equipped with a mirror mounted to the turret interior to allow the commander to see what it is that he's doing. So now we move to the gunner seat. To his direct front, we have an M10 periscope. This consists of two components. You have a unity sight here for just general observation or really close range targets. And you have a by six telescope to its right, which is the primary sight. You will note it goes through the turret roof so you can observe whilst in a turret down position. To the left is mounted the M71 auxiliary telescope. This is a by 5 sight with a fixed reticle and it is used in case the primary telescope is inoperable or just simply used to make sure that the gun tube is clear of any obstacles because it is mounted low and coaxially to the gun. The gun itself is the 19mm M3. You'll note there is an interior travel lock mounted to the turret roof. Further to the left will be the coaxial 30 cal. To the gunner's direct front, we have power traverse. Now the traverse only is powered, elevation is purely manual. There is a linkage which goes from the handle to the electric motor down there, and then the pump which is here. There is a manual traverse, you release the brake, and quite simply crank. So further down we have the elevation handle for the gun and behind it is the manual trigger used in case of a failure of the electrical firing system. This is the gear change lever and what it basically is is the manual or hydraulic option for the traverse. So up is hydraulic and down will be manual. Finally down to the right is a turret lock which is used to stop the turret from traversing. The loader's purpose in life is of course servicing the guns. The big one, the 90mm M3, is percussion fired and uses a manual breech, although the breech block has been dropped from this particular gun. To its left is a 30 caliber coaxial machine gun. Behind this is a ready rack, and what this consists of is basically 10 rounds of immediate use ammunition. In the event that the 10 ready rounds are expended or there is a lull in combat, additional stowage can be found in six compartments under the whole floor. He also has, just behind him, a pistol port, which can be used like so. We're going into the driver's compartment. Both the driver's and the assistant driver's hatches are sprung with torsion bars. And of course, the seat has two positions, up and down. So starting off at the right hand side, the most obvious thing is to fix the CO2 fire extinguishers. They could be manually activated from inside by pulling the pin and then down. There is also another pull handle over behind the assistant driver's hatch. Directly to the front is a master power box. This is two options for the 24 volt and the 12 volt systems. The 12 volt is only ever used if you have a 12 volt radio, otherwise it's uh, just ignored. Power on, power off. Moving further forward, brake release and the instrument panel. The panel components, moving from right to left, are pretty self-explanatory. You have a fuel tank selector which determines which tank's level is displayed on your gauge. All the circuit breakers on or off, and the warning lights for the oil pressure and oil and water temperature for the transmission and engine respectively at the bottom right. 
You have your amperage coming out of the generator, your tachometer, how many revs you're pulling, and you can turn on and off your personnel heater. Differential oil pressure. The fuel cutoff is used to stop the engine. You don't actually turn the magnetos off, you just press and hold and the degassers will basically stop the engine that way. Turn on the panel lights for the instrument panel and this is how the external lights are turned on. Speedo, oil pressure, engine temperature and these outlets are used if you want to attach an external uh, flashlight or some similar device. So if you wanted to start the tank what you do first of all is make sure massive power is on then you would check your fuel tanks and then open up your fuel cutoff valve which is located down by your feet. Ensure you're in neutral. Turn magnetos to both. Now there is a booster lever here but it's actually completely uh, unused. Uh, it's just part of the part number. When you're ready, throttle up your throttle, the hand throttle about three quarters of an inch and press and hold start. Hopefully the engine will now roar into life and you'll idle at a thousand RPM and then after the warm up you drop it down to 600. Now it is possible if you can't get the engine to start by yourself to tow start the vehicle. And what you do is you get another tank to tow you at about 18 miles an hour and then you just drop it from high range down to low. Of course the magnetos have to be on. The catch is that tow starting can only be done if the engine is already warm. The three ranges. The first range only goes to 9 miles an hour, 18 to second, and the top range is 30 miles an hour. So a couple of points to note about steering. As the steering is conducted by application of the brake, there is no neutral steer capability. The tank must be moving forward in order to, to turn. Uh, the turning radius is about 20 feet. Uh, something else, if you are doing a particularly tight turn, let it go forward and back every now and then, and that way it releases a bit of the tension on the track to less chance of walking it off. Lastly, the manual is very adamant that when you are not applying the brake, you push forward on the levers all the way to the stops and this makes sure that you don't have the brakes riding and uh, that way they aren't going to overheat back in the differential. The driver only has one periscope but at least it is rotatable so that he can get a different field of vision depending on which way he wants to look. Now the assistant driver is referred to in fire commands as the bog, the bow gunner. He has a complete set of driver's controls available to him and can take over driving the vehicle if required. He also has the 30 caliber Browning machine gun to his direct front, which is fired simply by watching the tracers through the periscope in the assistant driver's hatch. Pershing was not the most successful tank that the US ever designed. However, the improvements in armor, firepower, and mobility were such that it has to be considered significant for those reasons alone. With the issues with the transmission and engine particularly, the writing was already on the wall by 1950 in the Korean War, with the tanks due to be replaced in service by M46. That's it, I hope you enjoyed your tour, and I'll see you on the next one.